point where I submit talks, um, things I'm passionate about, and every now and then I'll throw one or two talks in there about something that you know I kind of want to learn about. Um, music playing is one of my favorite bands out there. Um, I've decided I want to get an Android development, so we'll talk to them and uh, talk to them about getting an Android app built for them because they have an iPhone one. And I just thought it'd be a great excuse and be something I'd have some fun with. So I submitted to this conference out in Ohio and uh, put a bunch of soft skills talks on there, and one of them I had was uh, Ruby and Android. Um, knowing that the library was out there, having seen a couple talks on Roboto and some things, uh, I submitted it. About three weeks before the conference, I sit down and start playing with it, just about the time the proposal for this talk conference comes up, as well as another one. So send it, I send a couple of the abstracts on, and I get picked for it here. Um, I start playing with the library, and I absolutely <laughs> can't stand it. Um, I'll go into why in a little bit, but uh, the, uh, the night before my talk there, I'm just I, I'm having a heck of a time trying to figure out how I'm going to pull this out. Um, I could do the, I, I looked back at some of the talks I'd seen and realized they were very, very handy. And um, I kind of laughed at that, and then part of my brain kind of went, well, maybe I'll just do that. Um, decided not to. Uh, the night before, in a fit of desperation, I Googled one more time <coughs> Ruby and Android and found something that really just saved my day. And has since sparked some real uh, passion in me again. Um, okay, yes. Um, that isn't that hard to do with me, but um, I'm having a lot of fun with it. And uh, I do not have slides, not because I'm not prepared, but because um, I've literally, up to the last uh, 10 minutes, been hacking on this library some more, adding some more features that I wanted to finish up. So um, this talk is actually a moving target, which is kind of fun, and I uh, thought I'd go through it. Before I do, um, oh, yeah, so the reason for telling the story, uh, the funniest part of the story was, it's like 2 in the morning, I've not yet found this, this new library and been excited. I'm just like beating my head against the table. And in comes an email from Mike Moore that says, By the way, you've been selected here to talk about JRuby on Android. I just wanted to jump out the window of the hotel. I mean, I was just dumb. Um, it, was, uh, it was quite interesting. But it's gotten much better and really excited about it. So, um, yes, the funny thing. Who's done Android development? Okay, not me. Um, so, for those of you that have not done it, um, I want to kind of go through the metaphor just a little bit, explain a little bit about the environment, because all of this plays into uh, where things are, what I like to look at, and what I want you guys to keep an eye on over the next six months. Um, so Android itself, uh, operating system for phones and um, tablets written by Google. Um, they have, uh, it's, it's, it uses Java, uh, but they wrote their own JDK. Um, for one, because the, uh, the existing one is just, um, I, I don't think Gargantuan really describes how large this thing is nowadays. Um, they wanted to strip out a lot of it. The other thing is they wanted to deal a lot more, uh, get a lot closer to the metal as far as processes and taking advantage of Unix um, infrastructure and architecture that's there. Um, and so they were what's called Dalvik. But um, as far as your um, development experience goes, um, I find Android to actually be incredibly enjoyable to, to uh, program. As a device, um, I, look at, I look at it as, um, um, I actually can't uh, claim to have come up with a statement, a friend of mine did, uh, that says Ruby is, or excuse me, Android is going to be the Windows of the phone market. It's going to be a little less responsive, it's going to be a little uglier, it's going to be a little shitty in UX, but realistically it's going to have the majority of the, um, uh, of the market share. And as we're looking at it, it's growing, it's getting there. And actually what's interesting is if we want to go with that analogy of Windows, the development environment is actually incredibly enjoyable, which for those that have done Windows development wholesale <laughs> inside of the entire stack, they actually make the experience quite nice and quite easy. And so Android's done very, very well about the development experience. I spent a lot of time, I've spent some time doing iOS development, and um, yeah, I tried to pull out what little hair I have left. Um, so, um, when you get the uh, you get the Android install, um, it's pretty simple. Um, you go down and download it, and then you have um, this nice uh, synaptic like uh, um, like window. It goes through and shows you the avail available packages that you have. You go through and download them. Um, you get the uh, you can look at the Android repositories themselves. This always does this. I'm so connected. Um, 
So it goes through and finds uh, platforms that you can go to. Um, Android is one of those uh, places where you're developing where you're going to have like a thousand devices to work against. So you want to get as many of these um, SDKs down as you can before you start deploying. And then you have this third party apps. And the only reason I wanted to show this is I find it incredibly ironic that um, if you look at third party add-ons, Google is actually listed. Um, if Google is the one that developed it, I'm still trying to figure out how they're a third party, but we'll see. Um, all kinds of stuff in here. You have this new Samsung uh, for a lot of the Zoom uh, tablet um, libraries that are out there and so forth. So you install your packages, um, you get your different SDKs that you want, whatever APIs you're looking for, and there's some good samples in here. Then you work on your virtual devices. Um, the uh, virtual devices are just virtual machines that run. You can find packages out on, um, out on the internet uh, that give you the nice uh, metal around. Um, and uh, they're incredibly uh, fast, as you can see. Um, doing Android development actually caused me to go get more RAM and an SD SSD. Um, so I said the experience is enjoyable as if you've got a lot of patience. Um, so, um, so you look at the different things you have, you have these AVDs, these, uh, these, these packages of, um, uh, of virtual machines for, for the phones, basically. The thing that I still have yet to figure out, I would love it if somebody could point this out to me, is how if I have a device in my hands, I can sit and make a new device, because they're pretty simple here, you have lots of properties to choose from, you have lots of targets you can do. Um, I still have yet to figure out how I can get into a phone, look and see what I'm holding in my hand, tech spec wise, and recreate that here. You actually have to go out to Google, which is incredibly ironic, I'm holding it in my hand, um, but find somebody else that's got it. And most of the phones out there, somebody has done uh, specifications for, um, and you can get it. So anyway, you have different ones that you can then fire up and run with. You get the emulator, this is nothing new. Um, it has the, uh, let's see if I can remember the, nope, that's not one. There it is. Uh, it has rotation built in. Uh, so you can uh, rotate it for yourself. You've got your on-screen keyboard here. Um, as you can see, the highlights, um, at least I hope that comes across the projector, where you can see if, like, if you were to click the power button or if you were to click the volume, you can, but you use your mouse as your finger um, and you can get moving with it. Now, if you do any reading about Android, you're going to notice that, um, that it is all based with Eclipse. Every single bit of documentation I've found about anything, and a lot of it's really good. Uh, there's a great book by the Prags about this. Hello Android really gets you started in the, in the scenario. But everything has a clip built in. Don't think you have to use it. I don't know why the authors all recommend to use it. They have some you know, template generators and this kind of thing. But as, when it comes down to it, you don't need it. And you know, Eclipse was slow in its best of days. So um, don't go and grab it. What you do get is this thing called ADB. Um, the Android Debug Bridge. And so once you get that running, a simple command line help, you'll see they've done a great job of giving you the command line tools to do what you need to do with your phone. So between ADB, the Android Virtual uh, Simulator, and a text editor, you're out of the run. Um, and this is not trying to be fancy, trying to get into the command line. This is really, it's just as easy as getting Rails installed. Everything else just works. Um, play around with some of the commands you have here. Um, one of the fun ones to do once you get it is uh, once you have one running, is um, go up and get shell into your phone because you know it is just a Unix device. Um, you see the process is running. You do your go ls, put your CD into wherever, um, and uh, put your bash profiles on the cross. Um, and you can see whatever whatever it is you want to see. Play around with it. Kind of nice and fun. Um, not really that useful unless you're uh, getting out of bare metal. But you'll see that um, uh, you'll see uh, it does have things talking about the servers uh, that you can start, reboot. Um, you can get in and uh, install and uninstall. Um, the Java Debug Wire Protocol is set up here and is supported for anybody in the Java space. It's really nice um, and visuals as to what's going on inside. Um, and then you have uh, the ability to, um, I guess, log cat, I believe, uh, to uh, get your log. Yeah. So, um, 
You can view the device log, just tail it and let it run. It's pretty nice. So that's the uh, emulator's ADB. So now Dalvik. Dalvik is the name of the virtual machine that they've done, they've written in order to run on the phone. So the lawsuit's based about the nine yards. Um, but what they've done is rewritten the JDK. Stripped out a lot of it, taken advantage of a lot of the processes and the things that are going on. Makes it very, very nice. But they did rewrite it. This is something that's been around for a long time. JDK is nice in apartment. They missed a couple areas. Some areas that they don't really need that much. One of them is reflection. Um, and that becomes very important uh, when we start looking at JRuby. So as far as development goes, um, you have really good, well-defined metaphors to, um, to program with. So first of all, I do not classify this part as the pretty good, but they have declarative layouts in XML. Why anybody uses things XML for anything but data transport, I still have yet to figure out, but we'll go with it for now. Um, so you get these, um, here we go. So you get these XML files that use, um, actually that screen is really big, so I'm gonna see if you guys are okay with bumping the font size down just here. A little bit more on the screen. So behind each one of these views, you have an activity. The activity is basically the code behind it, your controller, so to speak, right? Um, takes in what you want. You can handle your events in there if you want, um, or you put those in separate classes. But for now, just any of the code behind the layout itself. You have this idea of services. It's any code that runs in the background. They talk about music a lot. Let's think of Pandora. You would fire up your Pandora app. You'd have your XML file for your visual display of what's going on, you have your activity that would show the album, go connect to the server, and then what it would do is it would spin up and create a uh, service that then goes and starts playing the music. What this allows you to do is go out and navigate to other applications and continue on. This is the idea, this is where the whole multitasking thing comes in. Um, you have this idea of broadcast receivers. Um, if you've worked with, um, with message queues a lot, think of these as topics. Um, you receive messages from the system, so you put out there and say, look, I want to get SMS messages, just like you would register a topic if you're out there. It's going to notify whoever's in this list um, in a listener fashion and let you know. This is the way you can, um, you can create apps that handle email. You can create apps that handle SMS without monkey catching the system or anything like that, and then the user can choose what they want to do with it. You then have content providers which serve up your data. They, um, they're, you know, they're the model. If you want to sort of a database, you know, SQLite, something like that, you want to sort of a file, you want to grab stuff from out on, um, over a REST service, something like that, this is where they would come in. So this is a really nice metaphor to glue together for, um, for an entire application. So any questions so far? Okay. What you guys are quiet. Or bored, I'm not sure which. Um, okay, with all of these, if you go to uh, developer.android.com, there's a fantastic set of documentation that walks through all of these items for you. Um, and I really recommend that you take the chance, if you want to do some Android development, take the chance and do a Java, um, do an application in Java first. Very simple, bare bones one, there are a bunch of them out there. As a language, Java is not terrible. It's not, you know, it's not great. Uh, there's a lot of power that it's missing. Um, but the things that we usually don't like about Java are the XML, the JDE, all the layers we put on top of ourselves, um, and, uh, and whatnot. But I highly recommend going in here for, for two reasons. One is, again, it's not as scary as you think. 
Number two is you'll get used to reading the documentation because all the documentation you're going to find is going to be in, um, is going to be in Java in that form. But following along with their documentation, you really can't go wrong. So it is running uh, Java and has its own JVM. So we have jRuby, right? jRuby runs on top of the JVM. Complete implementation of Ruby. We have the freedom to program anything we want in Ruby, but if we want to do it and put it out there. Well, it turns out it's not quite that easy. So when they rewrote the JV, JDK to Dalek, they had a bunch of issues with, uh, they found a bunch of issues in reflection APIs. Now, traditional Java programming, traditional libraries, things like that, don't take advantage of reflection a lot. It's usually looked down upon. We don't consider metaprogramming something separate. It's just kind of part of the ebb and flow of what we do. Um, I, and a library like, or a, uh, a language implementation like jRuby pushes Java reflection to the edge of the cliff, and in the Dalek's case, it pushed it right over the cliff. So they found a lot of things were going on. Google Summer of Code decided to thumb their nose at the Ruby community, and if anybody kept track, it was really cool. The Ruby community decided, screw it, we'll do our own. And so we raised, anybody know how much was raised? Mm -hmm. This was $100,000? Yes, about $100,000 was raised to do the Ruby Summer of Code, where students can sign up, they have ideas for open source software, <coughs> and they get sponsored with this money to go and work on this. Somebody came along and said, I want to do JRuby on Android. And um, one of the mentors that signed up uh, to do this was Charlie Nutter. He thought it was a great idea because he could work on the JRuby pieces as somebody worked on the library. So Robot was, was, uh, was born. So they started working on this, and it was the, I believe it's the first time that in uh, the history of Summer Codes that there was a high school student actually um, paid to do this. And he's the one that wrote Roboto. Um, this is not why I'm not a fan of my library, by the way. It's just an interesting little fact. Um, so Roboto comes along and uh, lets you do, um, and lets you actually do the on, um, on the application. So um, here. Okay. So one of the examples is Roboto IRB. So what you would do is generate uh, use Roboto command lines to generate um, your file for you. And it's going to give you a whole slew of folders, um, an absolute slew of folders. You're going to get a property spot to work with where you indicate where you're storing your SDKs. You are um, giving your um, build properties. Um, you decide where uh, what the package is going to be. So for those that aren't familiar with it, in Java you have a packaging structure, um, usually done in your URL in reverse. So if your URL, in our case, edgecase.com, it's com.edgecase. Uh, you would use, and then you mimic that in folders. So each dot in the hierarchy is going to be a folder in which your uh, source is stored. And so you can come down here and, um, so that's the source that's generating. So in Roboto's case, you have this idea of assets folder, where you come in and you have your scripts that you can write, right in the right of the JRuby. Um, with a couple of interesting little things. First of all, uh, the activities that are classes, um, well actually, let's take a second, and... And yes, anybody I've ever made a snide comment to about editors, fully gets to make fun of me for using TextMate here. Um, but uh, every time we do a presentation about folder structures and things and move around Emacs, people get lost. So, uh, all right, so your job would look something like this. Pretty uh, plain and simple for an activity. You're going to extend the activity. You're going to um, create a method on create with the same instance state. Take care of that. You always want to pass it up to super. And then, um, in this case, just set your content view. Nothing spectacular here. Uh, it's simply a, your typical kind of controller idea of taking care of what's been done before, making sure to preserve the state if there is any, and continue moving on. Um, just like any phone application is going to do, applications layer on top of each other. Um, so you really want to make sure to keep calling super and passing state up and down the chains as you go along. Very, very critical uh, to make sure the flow works correctly and back buttons and so forth. Um, so 
this is what you would look like in Java, and then in Bravado, you get um, um, you get your activities that would be somewhere down here. And uh, let's see here. So, yeah. So you get these global variables for your activity, and then um, you do uh, instead of on something. You actually call handle um, and do what you're going to do in here. Here's one of the places where I was not a big fan of things because we're, first of all, we've got global variables. I'm not a huge fan of those. It's really, really hard to get your arms around them to test because they are global. So getting out there, you can't redefine them and reset to something, but realistically, it's really hard to get your arms around in like a test uh, structure case or a, a test harness. Um, so strike one in my case. Um, strike two was this idea of um, your handling um, handling things instead of calling on. There's a metaphor that's already there. I'm not sure what the metaphor is that they're going with here, but it is, bro it is broken down um, into their own thing. The other thing was there is a lot of, <laughs> as you start exploring an API, you start playing with things, right? You start seeing, okay, does this work? Does this work? Uh, for those of you that do not have attention surplus disorder, um, some of us like to take shortcuts and not read the entire set of documentation before we go off and do things. So you're trying different methods. Does this method exist? Does this method exist? Um, it turns out there's a lot of instance eval calls underneath the covers of the bot. If you're playing with a new library, that is going to hang you very quickly because you're not passing file and line information in. Therefore, your errors come back and just say something went wrong here in this eval block. And um, again, error pulling out, really difficult for me. So, um, now I do know people that are having great luck with this. Please feel free to go ahead and try it. With that fit of frustration, I went around and kept looking and ended up with, um, over here, ended up stumbling upon something, um, something called Garrett. Um, uh, Garrett was a test application that Phil Hayward had written. Uh, Technomancy, for those of you that uh, know him, um, had been just to play with, to see what would happen with putting Mira on top of Android. Now, for those that aren't familiar, Mira is what used to be called Doobie. Um, I'm still trying to decide if uh, Charlie Nutter really was that naive or just that really smart. Um, he was playing around one day with um, the idea of adding optional typing to JRuby. He's been working very, very hard on getting JRuby optimized and getting it much faster. It's been blowing Ruby out of the water in a lot of places, but there were still some places where it was really far and above where Java could be. There's some items that the, JD, that the, uh, the JVM as a whole does not support in method dispatch and figuring things out very quickly. So he thought, what would it look like to add optional typing in? Places where we can infer it, we can guess at it, but if we can't, you can put it in. And so he created this library called Doobie has now been renamed to Mira. And Mira goes through, and he's had a couple talks where he shows you know, the, the, uh, the infamous Fibonacci sequence. It goes in and it comes down to a factor of like 10. Um, it's the factor of 10 slower without the typing, puts it in much faster. Really interesting how it works. Because of this optional typing, because of the way it's set up, they don't have to deal with a lot of the Java reflections there, a lot of the guessing, a lot of those things. So they came out with Mira. I always thought it was an interesting project, never saw use for it until now. So I played with Garrett, excuse me, looked at Garrett, and it looked very promising. Um, since then, it has been extracted into a library called Pinda, uh, P I N D A H. Um, Pinda is taking Mira and put it on the phone and giving it into a library. So the first one was just kind of let's play and see what happens. It works, hey, that's cool. Um, <coughs> Now, everything was wrapped together, taken and packaged, and given you a way to create applications. And so since then, that is what I have been working on um, for, um, for my application that I've been working on here. So um, you get in these, um, in some cases, um, you can add, sorry, let's show, show a quick example of Mira itself. 
in the wild. Okay, so simple class here this is a great example. Um, you create a hello method down here. You pass in a variable which you tell it is going to be a string. It then is able to operate. It doesn't have to do any guesswork before it goes and fires things off. So, um, but again, very Ruby-like in a lot of ways. Um, so Pivot comes along, and now you can create applications with that. So you generate your application, and it ends up looking a lot smaller. Um, you get your, um, actually the downloads folder does not come with it. That's something I'm putting here. Um, you get your source folders. Now, because it is a lot closer to Java, you have to do a lot more things like you would there, one of which is store your code according to the package structures that are there. So if you declare something in a package, you actually have to follow those folders through. Um, something most Java programmers forget about because our IDEs used to hide it from us. Um, but it actually happens in covers as well. And then um, things start looking very similar minus some semicolons. Um, but realistically, it is Ruby code and you're able to do it. Um, very easy to take current examples that are out there um, in Java for Android and port them over very quickly. Makes it very easy. Um, but, uh, but then use Ruby to you know, loop through things and whatnot. So at the moment, this is what we have working. Now the other thing was with Vado, every time you go to deploy, this thing takes anywhere from um, you know, 10 minutes to, I don't know, three hours. Um, it would take forever. It goes and compiles the whole world. Um, I'm all, I'm all, uh, completely convinced. Um, it takes JRuby, strips out a lot of the libraries and stuff that don't work. Uh, a lot of stuff that's not needed, puts it aside, puts it back together. So a lot of things happen every time you run rate to go deploy something here. In the case of pinned up, it's a lot closer. You don't have a lot of that. It's a very, very fast deploy, uh, comparatively speaking. Um, out to your phone. And then, um, so you go and run through break, and it's going to go build it, um, and then push it out to the phone. That was well timed, thank you. Not sure if that was, but it was also. Awesome. Um, so it goes and deploys it. You go back to your phone. Go and view it. Nothing special right now. A uh, very simple um, application. Buttons that go, bring up the next screen. I have not done anything for the next screen. So um, this is working here. Now, I looked at this and thought, there's still some things I'm not a big fan of. Um, most of our methods are still very Java-based, very Java-looking, right? Um, and also, there just seems to be things. So, for instance, calling, uh, calling super with the state, make sure you always pass it up. Something you've always got to do. I want to get it out of my way. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to have to do it. So, here is what I spent the last, uh, I don't know, most of today working on. Um, was generating some class level methods that just did that for us, shrunk it down a little bit. And I'm like, you know, hey, it's Ruby, right? This should be pretty easy. Well, thank God Nick is here. Um, who's given a bunch of talks on Mirror because it was not easy at all. Um, Mirror is a different language, and you have to keep this in mind. The way to get this to work uh, is actually using what are called macros. So um, they don't have, you don't create these class level methods, you actually create macros that go through and actually start harnessing onto uh, the AST. They've abstracted that bit of AST to do that. If anybody's worked with macros in Lisp, these make a lot of sense, okay? Quoting, works very, very similar to the way it does there. Um, and it is then behavior that's then latched on. So in this case now, I don't have to implement my own action listener like I did in, um, uh, like I did previously, which actually I left that part off. Um, um, so the way to, to implement um, Interfaces in um, in JRuby and Pinda is to use uh, class level method implements. Um, so all of this is then hidden back away um, when I go to the new form, right here, and whatnot. Uh, step two is going to be again realizing that this is a separate language. Um, I've been working on something called Droid Views 
that I've been calling Droid Boost for a while, because I don't like XML. So uh, APK file here, um, stash H for Yes, yeah, so 228K for just a couple things. Not too bad. Um, it's a lot lower overhead than it's going to be for Roboto and all that, uh, because that was just our uh that it would generate. So there is, there is that. Very obvious when you play with Mira, how much we like about Ruby is actually in the parser. 
that was made brutally aware to me as I was sitting up there not listening to talks this morning trying to get some of this meta programming working. Um, it's amazing how much stuff we lean on that Ruby just takes care of for us. Um, absolutely insane. But yeah, it's true. So, uh, I didn't see it. Yes. The startup time is stupid long. Um, and the, so the question is, um, people that I have problems have been experiencing in Android is the really long startup time for em the emulators. They're insanely long. Uh, the only reason you didn't see it up here, I'm running on, on an SSD, and I'm actually running those right off of it, even though it's smaller. Um, there's no other way I can see to do this because it's just really, it's insane. No, actually, that's a good question. If you run a Roboto app the very first time you do it, the very first time you do it, there's a really long startup time because a lot of stuff goes on. A uh, really fascinating kind of tail you log in. Mira does not suffer from that. In that, it's it's and I, looking at other applications, I can't tell the difference. I'm sure there is, but you know, um, I'm slow enough that it's not a big deal. Anybody else? Okay, I'll be around. Feel free to catch me. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.